Yeah, once you stop moving, you're exposed to the full forces of, of, of Mother Nature, which, you know, I don't even want to contemplate how cold it was. And, that, and the, 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 one of the side effects of being extremely cold is you become very drowsy. Mm. And just want to go to sleep. And just want to go to sleep. So we're sitting on this ledge and all you want to do, because of the hypothermia, is, is just nod off. But you know, the amount of experience tells you that if you go to sleep, you're not going to wake up. So you've got the four camp set up. You've been there for, you've done the 26, 28 days hiking. You've done another four weeks to set up your four mm, camps. With another two weeks for contingency, contingency. of bad weather. So How are you going to make your summit attempt? So that brings us into the early part of October, uh, which is what we were planning. And in those days, we had no weather forecasting. We just had to guess. Yep. So once a spell of, of bad weather finished in early October, we said, okay, the bad weather spell is finished. It's probably going to be, it's fair to say, it's going to be good weather for a little while, so let's go for it. So we did. So John and I went up from base camp to camp two in one day, camp two to camp three the next day, and then camp three to camp four the following day. So that brings us up to the 9th of October. Right. With the idea of going to the summit on the 10th of October, which is we what we did. And there was a lot of deep snow around on summit day, so we started early in the morning of the 10th of October. There was a lot of deep snow around, so our progress was extremely slow, uh, making our way up the, the summit slopes to Kanchenjunga, and then we get out of this gully just on about 5.30 in the afternoon. We should have been heading back down to Camp 4 at this stage, but we're getting really close to the summit. And then we get into all these large rocks and boulders, which we try and zigzag our way through, and then we, I get to, we get to the summit at quarter past six on the, uh, on the evening of the 10th of October. So the sun is just setting. Wow. And you can wow. really feel the cold. You can wow. really feel the cold just seeping into your bones. And, and by this time, you would, have, uh, you would have left very early in the morning. Yep. So you would have left at 2. We've been or going all day. All day. Yeah. You're not consuming food at this altitude. I think, or had, I think I had a liter of water with me and maybe a Mars bar or a muesli bar, but I probably I don't think I I think I'd probably much consumed my liter of water and I hadn't touched the uh, the Mars bar. So little food, little water. You've been hiking in really tough conditions yeah. all day. Yeah. You reach the summit take as the sun's going down. Yeah, take a couple of photographs and then just get the hell out of there. It's scary. It's it's really intimidating being on this incredibly high mountain at that time of the day, knowing the sun's going to drop. And it's going to get dark. And it's going to get dark, and the temperature is just going to fall out of the bottom of the thermometer. Wow. And you still got to get back to camp. And you've got no idea what the weather's going to do, really. No. You're just guessing. So, how'd you get down? Uh, gee, uh... So John and I separated at this stage because <coughs> we got to a certain point in our ascent where I've gone one way to the summit and he's gone the other way, which means we should reach the summit at the same time, but we didn't. So I'm coming down and I'm still expecting to see John, but I, I realise he's gone a different way around a pile of rocks, so he's gone around another pile of rocks, so I've missed him. And so I wasn't even at the summit with you. Like no, he, so no, you got up before because him. we're you know we're only fifty or hundred meters apart. Yeah, but that could represent forty five minutes in in yeah, time. Right. And then he he so on that final hour or so of the climb, because there's so many rocks involved that I could go around to the left hand side of a rock and he could go around to the the right hand side of a caravan sized rock. So mm. we could. We miss each other, yep. sort of, if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect sense. And then I come down, and that's exactly what's happened. He's gone around one big rock one side, and I've gone around the other, yep. and we've missed each other. Right. And so I'm continuing down, and I get to the top of this rock face, because I've come down a different way. Number one mistake, always descend the same way as you come up. Yep. First lesson my father taught me, but I'm, 
I'm a big boy now. I'm on the world's <laughs> third highest mountain. I'm going to take a shortcut <laughs> and I'll get myself into trouble. This shortcut leads to the top of a cliff. And I thought, oh, I've messed this up. And I, start, I try and down climb this cliff and I get halfway down. And I thought, no, I can't do it. Oh, God. So I've climbed back up again and it's dark. <laughs> oh, my God. And I've, 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 and I've thought, okay, you just killed yourself because there's no way you can get down this You're cliff. thinking this... St- halfway up a cliff. Yeah, uh, on top of the world's third highest mountain. Wow. It's night time. Wow. And, you're and I, I said to myself, you should have listened to Dad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and how's your body and your mind at this time? Because the fatigue's got to be taking its toll. Yeah, the fatigue's there, but it's been there all day. Uh, and the thing that I noticed was just how incredibly cold it was getting. Just how incredibly cold. Because we were climbing without oxygen. And if you, when you're climbing with oxygen, it's like fuel. So you, if you're climbing with bottle oxygen, you're actually warm. Right. Yeah. So your body's burning that, metabolising that oxygen, yeah. I guess. And that's but if you don't have it, as I was to find out many, many years later when I was guiding on Mount Everest, when I was using o- oxygen and it did run out, right. it was, when it ran out, it was like someone put a garden hose into my climbing suit and, and freezing turned it on. Cold water. Right. And freezing cold water started to fill up right. on my boots. That's what it feels like. Right. And is that that's obviously some me- metabolic thing? What what do you know what that why that is? Is yeah, it well oxi- oxygen is a fuel. Yeah, okay. And and, and, and if you if you burn the fuel, yep. which is what we do, yep. you create heat. Right, right. So if you're on bottle oxygen at four, four liters liter. a minute, yep. you're burning. You know, you burn so that's that creates heat. Yeah. But if you're on if you're using if you're not on bottle oxygen, then you've got a far, far less than four liters a minute. Mm. And that's why I was so incredibly cold. Yeah. And what, what was the temperature? Do you know? Oh, no idea. Who cares? I mean, it's yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when it gets that cold, it doesn't, figures don't matter. Right. Uh, because it's so dangerous that. Doesn't matter. It is just so dangerous. It's just, it doesn't matter. So you're at this point, Mike, and you've, you've come down, you realize that you've made a mistake. You haven't seen your climbing buddy in a while. The sun's gone down. It's dark. You've taken a wrong turn. You can't get any lower. What's going through your head? Where do you go from here? Well, I thought, okay, what's what? How am I going to get out of this? And there was two answers: climb all the way back up the mountain to a point where I could get back onto my ascent trail, which I I knew where that was. But when you can just, my progress was ten steps, and then I was breathless. Wow! And then it would take me a minute and a half to catch my breath. Mm. So that's that's what I've got. You know, it's going to take me probably an hour to get back up to my ascent trail, even though it wasn't that far, because mm. I, could, I could barely do 10 steps. The alternative was to try and get down the cliff that I had tried a few minutes earlier. And and how, how, sorry, just a, another ignorant question. How are you doing this? Is it like you're on ropes? Or you're on no, like there's nothing. Nothing. Just you're just gooching down with your hands and your feet? Yep. My God. Wow. The, wow. An, the answer, well, the answer to me at the time was to try and get down this cliff without falling off. Wow. And what the worst part about this cliff was not only was it vertical, but un- directly underneath it was a slab of rocks that were about 45 degrees. So if I fell off, uh, there's no can- chance of surviving the fall. If I did survive the fall, I'd land onto this slab of rocks at 45 degrees, which would shoot me straight over the edge. And you knew this uh, from climbing up? You knew where you were? No, I knew, I knew, no, no. I knew this from the fact that I tried to get down a few minutes. I tried to down climb this cliff a few minutes earlier. Right. So and the you saw what was there. You were like, and okay. saw what was there, and I ran out of handholds and footholds. But you've just decided. So you've decided that's your other option. Well, I decided that I can't. Cli- I can't. Po- I don't have the energy to climb all the way back up wow. to try and reach my wow. original ascent trail. So you're going to try and down climb. So again. I'm going to try and down climb it. So I take off. I had four pairs of gloves on. I take off the f- first two pairs of gloves, so I've got some feel. But in doing that, I'm really exposing my hands to frostbite. But I've got to hang on. Mm. Um, I'm going to cut it short by simply saying that I, I got down, scratching and scraping on the rock, and and just hoping that every little <sighs> handhold. I mean, we're only talking, you know, handholds. You know, a centimetre wide. With gloves on. With, with two glo- pairs of gloves on. Wow. And, you know, spo- uh, metal spikes hanging off the end of your boots. Uh, anyway, I got wow. down. 
So you got John had more sense than me. He's he came down the way that we climbed up. Anyway, so I took take the shortcut. So <laughs> and I, I I eventually get back to our original scent trail. So right. I join up to our original scent trail. And I thought, okay, you're on right. safe ground here. St- wait for John. So I'm sitting in the snow. It's now dark, or almost dark. And then I started to notice that I couldn't focus on anything. And I thought, oh look, no, it's just it's just dark the lights playing tricks the lights, on lights playing tricks on me then i sp- try and test myself by putting my hands in front of my face Jeez. and i think no nah, there's something wrong here i can't even see my own hand there's still a little bit of ambient light around and i thought oh you must be, you, the altitude's getting to you must this could be cerebral edema you need to be careful and then out of the darkness stumbles john and i think oh thank god he's made it this time and he's got back to me and we're on track now, but I say, to John, I say to John, look, John, I think there's something wrong with me. I can't see properly. And he said to me, and I'll never forget this, he said, yeah, I've got the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So we're losing our eyesight pretty quickly, not to mention the fact that it's the sunset. And so is this yeah. where the blood vessels in your eyes, the back of your eyes start to pop because of the yeah. pressure difference? Yeah, so it's called retinal hemorrhage. Thankfully, Jeez. John was a doctor and he said, I, I thought I was losing it. He said, no, oh, this, this is probably what's happening. It's called retinal hemorrhage and it's because of the extreme altitude. And it's where the blood vessels in the back of your eyes burst beca- and because of the atmospheric pressure, the difference in between the uh, atmospheric pressure and the pressure in the back of your eyes. I also had a bleeding nose, which means that the tiny, tiny blood vessels at the top of my nose here had burst. They're all bursting, right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so we both lost our eyesight. <laughs> and we're Do you feel a little better knowing that that's what it was and you weren't just losing your mind? <laughs> Marginally. <laughs> but the situation is we're only t- 150 metres below the summit of the world's third highest mountain. <laughs> we're both <laughs> as blind as bats. Um, <laughs> And the the temperature's dropping at the bo- out of the bottom of the thermometer, and we're a miles from our camp four. Miles. Oh, it might wow. as well be. Yeah. Wow. 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 So we start. So we decided. Okay, we've got to. We can't sit here because we'll freeze. We can't see where we're going, but we've got to keep moving. So we just do our bit the best we could, and we try and sort of feel our way down the remainder of the mountain, which we did a fairly good job under the extreme conditions. And then I was in front at one particular stage and I just started falling. And I thought, oh, God, I've got just walked over the edge. Just tumbling. You just started tumbling. Just tumbling. And then, uh, fortunately, it didn't last long and I just land in the snow. And I, I, I think I... Probably fell about eight or ten meters, and what had happened was I'd fallen into a crevasse, and that crevasse, is, you know, it's just a, you know, what a crevasse is? It's a, yep. a crack in the ice. Yep. Yep. And um, and I thought, oh well, <laughs> I haven't died just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but then I started to fall off this ledge that I was on. Right, so you start sliding off this ledge. Yeah, because I haven't landed well. Or properly. Wow. I mean, I can't see, so it doesn't really matter. It's dark. It's dark. And I'm falling even further off this ledge. And then it only takes a fraction of a second to, f- to figure out I still got my ice axe strapped to my wrist. And I stick the pick of the axe in the a- into the snow or the ice as it was to st- stop myself sliding any further off the ledge. Uh, and then I was able to call my way back onto the ledge and then gather my composure. And then, you know, I still can't see, can't hear John. So I thought, okay, where the hell am I? So I sort of feeling around and I feel this face, this vertical snow and ice face in front of me. And there's nothing behind me except air. So I thought, okay, well, I better try and climb this, this face, this face of snow and ice in front of me, but there's no handholds. <laughs> So I get my axe and chop out some letterbox style <laughs> hand holes that I can oh stick my, my hand into. Yep, yep. And that's how I climb out, chopping yep. out these hand holes. And I imagine it just sort of, I get to the surface and there's John 
not that I can see him, but he can hear me, sitting on the other side of the crevasse. So you've climbed up the wrong side. I've climbed up the wrong side. Oh, <laughs> he's on, no. I'm on one side, he's on the other. Oh, no. And I say to John, I think there's a crevasse between you and me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just climbed it. So I just fell into it. And climbed up the <laughs> other he, side. Did he know you'd fallen in? I think he did because he'd been calling out to me, but... You know, he, I couldn't. If you fall into it, uh, like I said before, those snow caves are soundproof. So I'd literally fallen into a big hole, and he he was. He, I think he might have been calling out to me, but I couldn't hear a thing. What a frightening experience for both of you. But for mm. I, I imagine him, you and your mate are struggling back to camp, and then all of a sudden, Mike. Yep. Mike. Mike. Yep. You're sitting there. I can't even imagine what goes through your head. You just go. Oh shit! Mm. Like, has he just walked off the edge? Yeah, well, exactly. That's what he thought. That's it's that's be, it. There's gonna be a million things going through your mind. Do I God. wait? Do I wait for him? Is he? Is he gone? His mind, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. <coughs> do I wait here? Like, I, I can't and wait I, here forever. I, I, to this day, I mean, and this is thirty odd years ago. I, I don't know whether he saw the crevasse. Well, he couldn't see it, but did he? Did he? Did he put his ice axe? Because you Feel climb down with your ice axe, and you f- we were feeling with our ice axes. Yep. And whether he put a, his ice axe into the hole, the, the crevasse, and thought, oh, there's a hole there. Yeah. That's, and that's what stopped him from following me, following, falling in after me. Wow. But then, you know, so he's on one side of the crevasse and I'm on the other. <laughs> and I say, look, John, there's a crevasse between you and, you and me. And he said, yeah, I think, that, I think you're right. And I th- so he has to backtrack and then carefully, very carefully find a way around this crevasse and he did it by poking until he had solid snow and uh, it's it took took it seemed to take forever so i'm not going to even try and expand on the story but, but eventually he comes around to my side of the crevasse and i i think i just said look this is a dangerous situation we could be into a, in a crevasse field yeah this whole thing could happen <coughs> again and we won't be so lucky. So we r- agreed, and so we just chopped out this these, this this seat or bench in the ice and sat there all night. Wow. You obviously knew that comes with huge risks in itself. Yeah, once you stop moving, you're exposed to the full forces of, of, of Mother Nature, which... You know, I don't even want to contemplate how cold it was, and that, and the, the the one of the side effects of being extremely cold is you become very drowsy, mm. and just want to go to sleep, and just want to go to sleep. So we're sitting on this ledge, and all you want to do, because of the hypothermia, is is just nod off. But you know, your mountaineering experience t- tells you that if you go to sleep, you're, gonna you're not going to wake up. Uh, but it's a it's a, it's t- it's a tempting. Yeah, it's a yeah. tempting path. Yeah, to follow, especially once you've 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 done all that physical exertion all day. Mm. You haven't eaten. You haven't. And your tried. body's just going, mate. You just need a little sleep. And you'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, just little, have a little have nap, a little and sleep, it'll be morning Mike. when you wake yeah, up. Yeah, you've yeah. you've earned you're warm, it. Warm. The sun will be up. You've <laughs> earned it. So you've spent the night, you and John, on this ledge. Was it the longest night of your life? Was it the most challenging? I have a very good sense of direction, and. Yeah, so the night just drags on and on, and I stand up and I do star jumps without falling off. And I'm thinking to myself, just to try and get some circulation going, and I'm thinking to myself, the tent is around here somewhere. My inner compass says, yep. we're, we're really close. But the other part of me says, look, don't even bother trying because you could just go straight over the edge. So we get through the night, and then w- with when dawn comes... We still had this retinal hemorrhage, which we, we, w- we had for another week. But when dawn came, it was like looking through a frosted windscreen of a car. So I suddenly had, compared to the night before, I suddenly had light, but it was a greyish light, like looking through a, f- a frosted windscreen of a car. And I could see John, he was just a blob of red, because that's the colour of his climbing suit. And he could see me. Did you have pink? Not on Canton Junga. I had yellow. Okay. I did have pink much <laughs> later, <laughs> later on. Good 80s colour. Fluoro pink. Um, anyway, so I could see these two blur. Oh, I could see this blur of red. 
And then off some distance away was a blur of yellow. And it didn't take me too long to figure out, but it was our tent. Wow. 50 metres. Wow. From where we spent the night out in the open. Wow.